Welcome to Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I'm James Shore. Every week we choose a software engineering technique, topic, or skill, come up with a challenge related to that challenge, uh, skill, and solve it live on stream. And this week, it's how to fix a bug, and that's a little bit more complicated than you might think. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with the code today, go to github.com slash jameshore slash livestream and check out the tag 2020-07-07. So let's get to it. How to fix a bug. Uh, well, we all know how to fix a bug. You, you go out and you find it and you fix it, right? The question is, so that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is not only how do you fix a bug, but how do you do it in a way that improves the long-term quality of your code base? How do you prevent bugs from happening in the future? So uh, there's, that's a little bit more than just how do you fix a bug. Uh, specifically, the challenge that we're working on today is uh, continuing to work on our Rote 13 microservice that we've developed in previous episodes. And you can find those down here, jameshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn. Uh, that's got the whole uh, episode in archive. So it turns out, and this is a real error, I made this mistake uh, without realizing it. Uh, it turns out that if you post to the microservice, if you post to the service and you put a query on the URL, then the service cannot find the URL. So there's a bug. So how do we fix that? And how do we do it in a way that really enhances the long-term quality? I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. Uh, while you're thinking about it, quick reminder that this show is made possible by the people who hire me for software development uh, training and consulting. I work with uh, software engineering leaders who want to improve their organization in some way. And that can be anywhere from helping their teams with training all the way up to doing process consulting, particularly around multiple teams working together. Uh, this is a wonderful group of people, above average, uh, talented, uh, attractive to their chosen gender, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you'd like to join this group, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com or visit me online, jameshore.com. I also am very happy to get tweets from just about anybody uh, as long as you're nice. Uh, hi, Elverse, welcome. Um, uh, just send me a tweet at, at James Shore, and uh, I'd love to talk to you. If you are interested in talking to me about my consulting services, uh, drop me a line, uh, email is best, and I'm happy to have a free conversation about, with you about what we can do together. Uh, so we already have a little bit of activity in the chat. Just a quick reminder, uh, your questions and comments are very welcome. This is a short episode today, so we've got lots of time for additional questions and comments if you're interested. So let's get to the actual challenge. What we want to do is we want to fix the query string bug in our microservice, and we want to do it in a way that enhances the long-term quality of our application. So we want to actually reduce the number of defects we see over time. We want to prevent defects from happening in the first place. How do we do it? Well, the approach most people take is you know, it's pretty classic. Uh, figure out what's the bug. So re reproduce the bug. Where is the bug? Find it in the code. And then they fix the bug. And if they're particularly sophisticated, they might even write some tests around the bug. And this process is incomplete, but it's still a good process. So let's go ahead and do this. If, uh, if you'd like to follow along, you can download the code again from github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. Uh, check out this tag 2020-07-07. Uh, after the stream is over, or if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you can download the finished results uh, with the tag 2020-07-07-n. I know the code happens to be written in node.js. Uh, this is not really a JavaScript stream specifically, but uh, if you are going to follow along with the code, you're going to need a copy of node.js installed. Other than that, everything is vendored into the repo, so you can build the code by doing build.sh or just build on Windows, and that will lint everything and uh, run the tests. And it's a little slow because I'm running streaming software. It'll be a lot faster for you. And if you want to automatically rerun the tests when the files change, run watch, and you'll get a nice little sound. And to run the code itself, use the run script, uh, dot slash run or run on Windows. And that will tell you how to run it. Now that will actually run the server. So let's go ahead and start that up on port 5000. 
And then over here in another window, I'm going to use one of my favorite uh, clients, my favorite command line clients, HTTP, HTTPy, which uh, you can find online pretty easily. I'm going to say post to uh, port 5000, wrote 13, transform uh, with the JSON object uh, with text equals hello. And that will work, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works. That transforms hello into URYYB. That's the Route 13 encoding of hello. But what happens if I add a query string to this, like foo equals bar? Well, uh, oh, and I have to escape the question mark. I forget this every time. Well, now we're getting a not found error, and that's our bug. Uh, so that's step one, right? We've reproduced the bug, we've demonstrated the bug, now we know that how it happens, and we also will be able to double check it when we're done. Now the next question is, where is the bug? And again, if you uh, if you saw last week's, and again, you can find those down here, jamesshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn. Uh, one of my favorite techniques for finding, thing in th finding things in code is to actually skim all the files. Now it's also useful to do a find in files using your, your editor, but I actually find that for just orienting myself to the code, starting out with a skim of all the files and just making a quick guess of what is the responsibility for each for each file name, not necessarily even looking inside the code, really helps me orientate myself. Uh, so that is how I typically approach finding bugs when I'm not already familiar with the code. Now in this case, uh, we, we did that last week, so I'm not gonna do it again. Again, check out the archive here if you're interested. The episode title, it, it came out on May 30th, and the episode title was, I think it was May 30th, something like that. Maybe it was July 1st. Anyway, the episode title was uh, How to Add a Feature. In this case, though, we've already done that, so let's just look at the code, and I'll uh, give you a quick overview. Infrastructure is our low-level infrastructure wrappers for things like the HTTP server. Logic is where the Route 13 logic actually happens. Routing is where routing happens, and uh, right here at the top we've got sort of our top-level traffic cops. Now, with a bug like the one we're seeing here, where things are not being found, first thing I'm going to think is that's a routing issue. So let's go ahead and look at that code and its tests. And if we look here, the nice thing about the router is it is nice and small, it's easy to understand. Uh, if we look here, we see this code right here. If request.url does not equal road 13 slash transform, then return not found. Hey, I think there might be a bug there. <laughs> so uh, what do we do next? Well, we found it, or at least we think we found it. Uh, next thing to do is text, test and fix the bug. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we've got our tests here, and the happy path says we transform requests. Then we've got some tests around bad routing and body parsing. I think actually we're talking about happy path. Happy path is how the code behaves when everything's working normally. And so what I want to say here is that it uh, ignores query string parameters or just query parameters. So I can just follow the pattern we've already got here. We're going to simulate a request, and we'll pass in a URL, which is going to be a valid URL plus some sort of query. And then we'll assert we get an OK response. And if you watched in previous weeks, you'll notice that the tests here are a little bit different. Uh, when I did the rehearsal, I, I found some opportunities to clean up the tests. And because I thought that would distract from what we're doing today, I went ahead and just made those changes in the code to, that we started with today. Uh, and I really like the way this code reads. I love how easy it is to write the tests. I love how easy it is to, to read the tests. Um, so let's see, we're going to assert that we have an OK response. And let's say that we're expecting an OK or hello in our response, which means that we're going to need to provide a bat body that has hello in it. And I'm going to expect this to fail because we have a bug. So let's see what happens. Well, it failed because we have a missing semicolon. <laughs> 
And there's the bug, uh, not found. So we have successfully found the bug. That's great. And fixing it, I think, is gonna be pretty straightforward as well. And just as a quick reminder, um, we do have lots of time today for questions and comments in the chat. So go ahead and feel free to put them in at any time. So over here in the router, uh, pretty sure that this is the source of the problem right here. And the way we can fix that is we can use the built-in URL object in JavaScript to parse out the, the raw URL string. So I'm gonna take this, and I'll pull it out, and I say that instead of wanting the URL here, what we really want is the, um, oh, what's it called? It's the uh, path name, I think. So to get that, we'll need to make a new URL object using the raw string. And then the path name is equal to the URL path name, like that. And if I did that right, it will work. But I didn't do that right, and that's because the URL object requires you to have a completely qualified valid URL. And this is just a partial URL. It's slash row 13 slash transform. So we have to provide a base URL, which we can't really do. We don't know what scheme was used to access this microservice because it could be behind a reverse proxy of some sort. We don't know what host was used to access it. So I'm just going to say that we have HTTP and unknown host, but it bothers me because I think there's a potential for somebody to come along in the future, think this URL is correct, and look up all kinds of stuff in here that aren't actually true. But it's not too bad because we're just using it in the context of this one little method. So it'll probably be okay. Anyway, I think that will solve it. And it does. So there we go. Bug fixed. Done, right? Shortest episode ever. Well, not exactly. We did fix the bug. And if we actually run the tests again, or run the manual test again, we should be able to see that. So yeah, we did fix the bug, that's good. But what we haven't done yet is we haven't actually made it so that the long-term quality of our software is improved. We haven't changed the code to prevent these sorts of bugs from happening in the future. So although this is a good process, I think it's incomplete. I think there is something else you should do when you find a bug. And here's a process that I like a little bit better. So yes, start out, what is the bug, and reproduce it. And yes, where is the bug, and find it. But then ask yourself, why is there a bug in the first place? What happened that caused us to have this bug? And analyze it. And then based on that analysis, you can test and fix the bug, but you might test and fix it differently. You want to do your fix of the bug in a way that prevents future bugs like this one. And that analysis of where the bug came from is the key. It's where you start. So let's take a look at uh, what that might look like. In my experience, there's basically four different categories that bugs fall into. Uh, they can be programmer errors, which is the programmer just made a mistake. It can be design errors, which is that there's always parts of the system that are just more prone to error than others. It could be a requirements error, which is the programmer uh, did exactly what they intended to, but what they intended to was wrong. And then there's systemic errors, errors where nobody really would have known that this was a problem because they've got a blind spot in that area. Um, so we just got a, a comment from Uncle Scientist is it, uh, is it fair to rephrase it as, is the bug a code error, is the bug a design issue? And uh, <laughs> that was a great segue, Uncle Scientist, thanks. Um, uh, which of course is what we just talked about. So let's look at each of these in turn. And when, based on the type of error that you have encountered, that also indicates what you can do to prevent this type of error in the first place. So let's look at each of those. Now our bug, only falls into one of these categories. And go ahead and think to yourself, you know, which category does this bug fall into? And we'll look at each one in turn, and we'll also talk about how can you prevent these bugs from, from how can you prevent future errors in this category from happening again? How can we prevent this type of error from happening again? And what that will do is that will actually increase the quality of your code over time, decrease the amount of defects that you have over time, which makes your code a lot more fun to work with. So first off, programmer errors. Programmer errors, again, 
are when you have, uh, when the programmer intends to do something and they do it wrong. They just make a mistake. And I would say that test-driven development is probably the best technique I know of for preventing programmer errors. Because as we talked about, again, way back in the first episode about incremental TDD, test-driven development is a series of validated hypotheses. It's a way of staying in control of your code and you're working in such small steps that it's really, really easy to think of all the different cases and to make sure that you've solved all of them. When I use test-driven development, I very, very rarely make errors in this category. So TDD, very much, highly recommended. I love it. <laughs> Use it to prevent programmer errors. Also helpful, pair programming, mob programming, code reviews, anything that can get an additional eyes on the problem. Although I'd say pair programming and mob programming are much more effective than code reviews. And also anything that just leads to mistakes like uh, being tired or being distracted or being under a lot of stress, anything you can do as a software leader to, to reduce that is going to help reduce programmer errors as well. Now, is our bug a programmer error? Well, remember what we had here was uh, we had a situation where we had just misunderstood what, uh, what we were going to get from the URL. Technically, that's a programmer error. I made a mistake. But did I program something different than what I intended to? Mm, no, actually, I programmed exactly what I intended to. I just got it wrong. So I would say that in terms of this categorization, it's not that type of programmer error. So let's move on to the next one. Design errors. Some parts of your system, Barry Beam says 20% of the modules in your system, are responsible for the majority of your errors. Uh, and again, Barry Beam says 20% of the modules in your system are responsible for 80% of the errors. I don't know if he actually had any research behind it, but it's the good old Pareto principle. Um, so it's probably correct. Now in our code, do we have a design error? Do we have a system that's just inherently prone to defects? I don't think so. I mean, this code's young enough that it's hard to tell. The way you really know where the design errors are in your system are by seeing the bugs come up over and over and over again in part, certain parts of your system. But as I look at this code, it's really small. It's pretty easy to understand. It has nice, uh, clearly defined responsibilities. The only thing that I would say is a little iffy about it is that we sort of mix together some of the generic routing stuff with the specifics of handling one particular endpoint, but we only handle one endpoint, so that's not really terrible. So I would say that, no, we probably don't actually have a design error. But if we did, uh, the way you can solve it is by when you come across these things, look at the code and say, what about this design is hard to understand? What about it? makes itself prone to error and then refactor. And of course, test-driven development makes it easier to refactor because you've got the test supporting you, especially if you're using sociable tests of the sort I've been talking about in this series. Again, you can find more here. Um, something else that's really helpful here is uh, test-driven as pair programming, mob programming, and to a lesser extent code reviews, because in pair programming and mob programming especially, you've got at least one person 100% of the time thinking about design. Uh, when you're pairing that 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 other person, they're not there to catch your semicolon errors. They're there to think about design. So it really improves your design to use pair programming and mob programming. Uh, something else that's helpful is simple design. That's just writing code that's as simple, you know, as Ron Jeffrey says, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Only solve the problems that you have in front of you. And then along with that, using evolutionary design, uh, incrementally improving the design as you go further. And if you'd like some references on that, I have some links to some writing and a talk I gave on evolutionary design. Uh, you can find that in the README of the code repo. And again, that's, uh, that's up here, github.com slash James Shore slash livestream. So that's how we prevent problems, uh, prevent defects that are related to design errors. But I don't think that's what we have here. So maybe it's in the third category, requirements error. That's when the programmer knows, does exactly what they intended to, but they intended to do the wrong thing. And at first glance, that's what we have here. But requirements errors are also errors where somebody did know what the wrong thing, that you were doing the wrong thing, if you had thought to ask them. So basically, is there a stakeholder you could have asked and said, hey, is this what you want? In our case, I think the answer is no. The stakeholder, who happened to be me, but you know, hypothetically, the, the business owners of the this crazy little company that wants a Route 13 service, they said, give us a Route 13 service. 
if you had asked, if you asked your typical stakeholder, what do you want us to do about query strings? And they would say, eh, you know, do whatever you're supposed to do. I don't care. Go, go bother somebody else. <laughs> so I would say that what we have here is not a requirements error in that sense. It wouldn't be helped by talking to customers and having a better understanding of what they wanted. And that is how you prevent these sorts of requirements errors. Some people think that the best way to prevent requirements errors is to write everything down really thoroughly in a document and then get stakeholder sign off or work with your stakeholders, do a lot of business analysts analysis and get them to write down what they want. But the reality is, is that stakeholders have a really, really hard time imagining what they're going to get until it's in front of them. So you can force them to sign off and you can use that as a bludgeon to say, we did what you wanted and you didn't get what you wanted. It's your fault. You can do that. It's not going to make anybody happy and it's not going to prevent these requirements errors. The best way to prevent requirements errors is to actually talk to your customers or your stakeholders. And one great way to do that is the, cl the classic XP, extreme programming technique of on-site customers. That's actually having a stakeholder join your team full time to be available to answer questions so that when you have nitty gritty questions about how is this thing supposed to behave? Oh, I'm writing an if statement. I only know how one half of it works. Hey, customer, you're right here. Let me ask you, what do you want to do in this sort of circumstance? Or you've got, um, <laughs> you've got, uh, You've got another situation where you've, you need to deal with errors. Hey, customer, we just realized that sometimes we may not get this thing from, uh, from folks. What, do you, what should we do in that case? Having your customers, your stakeholders on site, really, really valuable. It's the best way to prevent requirements errors. Now, uh, Pellet says, uh, <laughs> I love this, but if I wanted to talk to people, I wouldn't write code for a living. Yeah, that's true. And that's why you're part of a team, because hopefully some people on the team do want to talk to to other other people, and you know, a good team is balanced in that way. Um, <laughs> another way of getting stakeholder feedback and preventing these requires uh, these requirements errors is to to provide uh, to perform regular demos to actually show your customers and your stakeholders what you're working on and talk about your upcoming plans. That won't catch everything because people don't always come to those; they don't always speak up. But when they do, you can catch your problems earlier, at least earlier than ship time. Um, for If you're in a domain with really complicated problems, like uh, I worked with actuaries once, uh, getting examples from your stakeholders, written examples like in a spreadsheet where they're describing how they think and how to solve problems, that's really helpful. Don't ask them necessarily, what do you want the software to do? But say, can you give me an example of that? For example, um, <laughs> so to speak, uh, well, in one case, I was working with a company that did this was a long time ago and they were trying to do billing for ringtones uh, on your mobile device. And they had a lot of complicated rules about when to bill the customer because the credit card companies would charge them a lot of money uh, for billing the customer, relatively speaking. So they wanted to allow uh, charges to sort of pile up for a little while and then bill all at once. But they didn't want to let them pile up too long or to get too large. So we said, well, can you give us an exa some examples of this? And they said, sure. And then they said, so Mary, uh, buys a ringtone for 99 cents, but that's not enough. So we wait until she, so then she buys another one. Now she's accumulated $2 of ringtones. And so now we bill them. And in another case, Mary buys a ringtone for 99 cents and then nothing happens for 30 days. So then we bill them and so forth. So getting these sorts of examples are really useful when you're in a situation with complicated problems. Don't ask for examples about login or other stuff like that in case, unless your login is really complicated, but do ask for examples around things that stakeholders understand that people on the team don't. And then a final technique you can use here is actually sitting down and pairing with your stakeholders around stuff that uh, you need to iterate on. The user interface can be useful here. You can say, does this, how does this look? No? Okay. How about this? Oh, how about this? And just sort of refine your way into what you need. So those are all great, great ways of preventing requirements errors. But again, I don't think any of those would have helped us here because nobody knew that we had a mistake. So that puts us by process of elimination in the fourth category. Uh, before we do that, though, I see that Pellet's uh, got another comment here. In terms of requirements, do you like doing things like specification by example with the business folks? Uh, that is a great question. So if I understand you correctly, Pellet, and specification by example, you're talking about things like cucumber and behavior-driven development. Uh, hopefully I'm right about that. I do like customer examples, but... And actually, I loved them to the point that I was actually involved with the very first uh, 
specification by example tool, if, if I'm using the term the way you are, uh, which was called FIT. It was by Ward Cunningham and it stood for Framework for Integrated Test. And it was a tool for actually having customers write their uh, examples in a Word document or in a spreadsheet and have the code actually, uh, and have that actually test against real software. This is something that Ward had done back at a company called Ycash and he, he wrote a, uh, he created a version of that in Java and I wrote the C sharp version. I was actually the project maintainer for a while. Um, uh, Pellet says, uh, yeah, that is what he's talking about. Uh, not necessarily with those tools, but I like to get tables if possible. So yeah, I really like that idea. And I did consulting around this for a long time. And what I found was that the examples are super helpful, but the tooling around the examples, not so much. Uh, the idea with these tools was that you want your customers to actually write the examples for you. So you'd have, uh, so you'd have this trust on their part that they were getting what they wanted. But the reality was, they didn't really feel comfortable doing that. They didn't feel like they had time to do it. So what they would do is they'd pass it off to the rest of the team, or they would pass it off to testers uh, to do. And we actually had a, a stakeholder say this. We showed them the document with all the cells turning green, and they actually said, how do I know you didn't just program your software to turn these, greens, but it, these cells green, but it doesn't actually work? which was really frustrating because that demonstrated that profound lack of, lack of trust. Um, and you do often have these trust issues between stakeholders and their teams. That's a topic for another time. But what I realized is that we were spending a lot of time and effort on making these tests automated, but the value we were getting was from the conversations with stakeholders. We were actually seeing those conversations less because they were passing that off to testers to do. So I stopped doing the tools and actually uh, stepped back from FIT and Ward and I decided to retire FIT entirely. Uh, if you're still interested, I think FITness is still available and of course there's Cucumber. But uh, the conversation is valuable. You can even automate the results, the, the examples in your tests if you think that's valuable, but the actual tooling around it, I didn't find that super valuable. Um, Uh, so yeah, I'd uh, love to talk about that more if there's more interest. Uh, Uncle Scientist says, uh, how does stakeholder pairing differ from behavior-driven development? A uh, stakeholder pairing is when you're actually sitting down at the computer and, and doing real-time modifications to the code. So it's particularly useful when you've got something that has that benefits from that kind of fast feedback. Um, so that can be, if you're doing a game, might be maybe how the gameplay feels. If you're doing a UI, it might be about uh, colors and layout, especially if you've got, you know, you're doing stuff with the CSS. Um, it might be, if you're doing some sort of interactive component or interaction, it might be related to that interaction or interactive component. It's less likely to be in your business rules or other highly technical parts of your system because the feedback cycle is going to be too slow there and you're not going to get a lot of benefit from actually pairing with stakeholder around that. So uh, those that's uh, requirements errors. Uh, I don't see any other comments on that. So I think I'll move on to the next thing, which by process of elimination, uh, this is the fourth one. It must be where our issue is. And this is systemic errors. These are blind spots. These are issues where nobody on the team, not the programmers, not the customers, knew that there would have been an issue. Um, and often you find these by customers telling you. Or, But another technique for finding them is it called exploratory testing. And it's uh, sounds, there's another technique called ad hoc testing, and that's what this sounds like. Ad hoc testing is just sort of poking around in the system. Exploratory testing sounds like that, but that's not what it is. Exploratory testing is a experienced tester, often a professional QA person, using their intuition, experience, and also lists of heuristics to understand where errors often show up in software, and then creating test plans on the fly and executing those test plans as they go uh, to look to explore the application to see where the defects are. So they'll say, here's a heuristic, Things are us there's usually a problem, say, with Unicode. I'm going to try some Unicode stuff. Oh, I've that's showed me something new, so I'm going to now come up with a new test plan around that new thing. An exploratory tester might have found, or likely would have found, the issue that we found out here. Now, you don't want to have a test phase before you ship. You actually want to have a process that leads to such high-quality software that you can ship at any time. That's continuous integration and delivery. But it is really useful to do exploratory testing as a check 
on your process to see if your software is good as you think it is. And when you find problems, either through exploratory testing or through customers telling you, even though that's not ideal, now you know you've got a systemic error and you have an opportunity to fix it. In our case, I found this a problem just by realizing, um, oh yeah, I've got a, I probably have a problem here. I don't know, I don't remember why, maybe I went to a URL with a query string and it triggered me, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> that's, it just sort of came to me. Fact is that I have these sorts of, I make this sort of mistake all the time. I always forget about the query strings when I do it, deal with URL. So what you can do now is you wanna make the mistake impossible. Uh, preferably, be, preferably by changing the design. If you can't do that, then at least make it discoverable with an automated check. For example, on my jameshore.com site, I've got a blog. Mistake I make really often is forgetting to update the date. So I've got a check around that that actually goes through all my blog entries and checks to see that they're valid before it publishes. Uh, whenever I do a build, it checks the blog entries, all the blog entries for validity. And that way, when I make this mistake, it catches it right away. So we could have done that in this case. We could have written some sort of test that maybe checked all of our endpoints. We've only got one in this case, but maybe programmatically it goes through all of our endpoints, does a, a query string and checks that it works properly. That's not great, but if, if we'd had something like that, uh, we would have caught this error. You can't always check everything with an automated check. So in that case, at least make those mistakes harder to happen in the first place by changing your process. Maybe you've got a checklist. Um, a lot of teams have a done, done checklist. What do, they, what do they have to make sure is true before a piece of software is really done and they can turn that feature flag on or, or delivered or, or whatever. Um, so we could have added it to our, check, our done, done checklist. Uh, make sure it works when the query string exists. That would be one way to do it. But by far my favorite is to make mistakes impossible by changing the design. And that's something I think we can do in this case. So let's look at what, how that works and how that might work. So what we have here is we have a situation where we had, uh, if request.url does not equal root 13 slash transform return not found. This is a systemic error because it was a blind spot, which means that every endpoint we created would have had the same problem. It would have been present throughout the system if I hadn't realized it at sort of after doing the first one. But if we were doing a lot more programming, we would have written a lot more endpoints before it sort of came to mind. That's what makes these things, these blind spots, systemic. So how could we prevent this sort of error from ever happening? How can we change our design so that it's flat out impossible to make this kind of mistake? This is by far the best way to deal with a systemic error. Well, if you look at this, the issue is that we have a URL and that URL is not what we thought it was. We thought the URL was just the path name, but actually the URL is the path name and the query string. So we could fix this by simply not exposing the URL. What if we exposed on our request object the path name, and then if we need the query string, which we don't, we could also expose the query string as a separate accessor. If we did that, we would make it impossible to have this sort of blind spot because now there's no URLs. So that's actually a really good solution. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna put this uh, back the way we had it. So that should be working. There we go, our tests are passing. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in and we're gonna modify this HTTP request so that it has a uh, path name instead of URL. So I'm gonna bring this up here. That's in our infrastructure. And our requests here. You can see there's our URL. So. Now what we want to do here is we want to replace the URL with a path name. It doesn't do us any good to just add the path name because now somebody can still use that URL and not misunderstand it. So we need to replace it. But we have sociable tests throughout our entire system, which means that if we just take this out, then not only are gonna, our HTTP request test gonna break, we're gonna break all kinds of tests throughout the system. You can see it here, our Road 13 router has broken. That's no good. Uh, and some people say that this is a downside of having sociable tests, is that when you make a change, everything breaks. But I actually see it as an upside because we've actually broken the system. So we want all the tests that are broken to now break. 
but it does mean that we need to take this incrementally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the new method. We're going to get that working. We're going to change all of our existing code to use the new method. And then only then will we be able to delete the old method. So let's do that. Uh, in our HTTP request test, we've got a bunch of tests around the raw data, which I think this kind of qualifies as. We've got some tests around the content type header, and then we've got some tests around nullability. And that's related to nullable infrastructure wrappers, which you can find in the archive under uh, infra uh, nullable, or it's, I think the episode is called Testing Without Mocks, actually. Uh, or you can see more of that in the whole microservice without mock series, which is where we built this Rote 13 service in the first place. So I think what we have here is we just want to add another accessor. Instead of providing the URL, it's going to provide the uh, URL's path name, uh, which ignores query string. So I can just follow the existing pattern. I can say that we're going to create a request. And we'll have a URL, which is my URL with a query. And that gives us a request. And then we can assert that the request dot, well, let's just call it URL path name is equal to my URL. And that's going to fail because it doesn't exist. So we'll add it. And that should fail saying that we expected my URL, which it did. And now I'll grab this code here, which we already know works. And we'll paste that in. And we'll need the right request. And there we go. So that was pretty easy. And I think that's thorough. I think that that's good enough. So now what we can do, now what we want to do is get rid of the old URL. Uh, but before we can do that, again, if we just take this out, everything's going to break. Um, so I'm going to go into our router, and instead of using the path name code here, I'm going to say request.urlPathName. That should still work. And the reason this works is because we're using sociable tests. If we were using a mock to mock out our HTTP request, uh, now we'd have to make a change to our mocks. Um, and that's one of the reasons I don't I like using sociable tests rather than mocks, because you can do this sort of refactoring without breaking anything, uh, which is really nice. Okay, so now our router isn't using the URL, so that means I should be able to come into here, delete the old test, and now I should be able to delete the new code, or the old code. And there we go. Uh, but that did fail. I've got a couple of other tests just in the HTTP request that use that URL, so let's find it. Oh, our nullable infrastructure uses URL, but it doesn't look like it's doing anything special with their queries, so I should be able to just change it here and here. And there we go. And for those of you who've been following along with the nullable infrastructure, the reason this works, or the nullable infrastructure wrappers, the reason this works is because we have the embedded stub. So the nullable infrastructure works by using an embedded stub, which is down here, um, this code right here. And all of our production code is the same for both our nullable version of our infrastructure and our real infrastructure. And that's really nice. Now we can change the production behavior. And as long as it doesn't change the way we interface with the actual HTTP request, everything just works. And, and I love that. So now we've taken out the URL. That fixes the problem. It is now impossible for somebody to accidentally forget to take to strip out the query string because there's no way to get the URL without the query string. Now, if we, you'll notice I haven't added a method to get the query string, and that's because we don't have any code for that. That's the simple design idea. We don't need to do that, so we're going to follow uh, Ron Jeffrey's saying of Yagni. You aren't going to need it. And we don't need it, so we're not going to implement it. If we ever add an endpoint in the future that does care about the query string, super simple to come in here to the request and add it in the future. And we will have better ideas, so maybe we won't just say a query string accessor. We might even do something more sophisticated, like give me specific parts of the query string or parts of the query string or something like that. Don't know. Don't need to do it. Not going to worry about it. So that is actually it. That is how to fix a bug in a way that increases the quality of your code 
uh, long term. Uh, I see some questions starting to come in. Um, and I will take those in a moment, but let me summarize, and then I've got a couple of announcements, and then we've got lots of time for additional questions, if anybody likes. So again, this is how to fix a bug, and what we've done here is, in addition to the sort of typical approach of figuring out what is the bug, where is the bug, and then testing and fixing the bug, we're also analyzing the bug. We're saying, why is there a bug? And then we're using that to prevent future bugs. Uh, there's a variety of types of errors, and how you can prevent future bugs depends on the type of error. If it's programmer mistakes, you can prevent those with test-driven development and so forth, but test-driven development is by far the best way to prevent just sort of dumb programmer errors. We all make them. Design errors, some parts of your system are just gonna have more bugs than others. You can, when you run across those, refactor the code and make the design better. Requirements errors, talk to your customers. It works. On-site customers works really well, but it's kind of hard to get. So do it everything, anything you can to talk to your stakeholders. And then you will still have blind spots. You can find them with exploratory testing. And when you find them, do anything you can to either make them impossible or less likely. So that's how to fix a bug. Uh, I will take some questions in just a moment. A uh, couple of quick announcements first, though. Uh, first off, next week, uh, our next episode next week, which is July 14th, we're gonna be getting back into the nitty gritty of coding. We're gonna look at flaky tests. How can you prevent flaky tests? Specifically, tests that involve dates and times. So we're gonna be looking at clocks. Uh, that's gonna be July 14th, uh, noon Pacific as normal. And uh, I hope to see you there. And I also wanna remind you that if you liked what you saw today, then uh, happy to do this sort of work with you and your teams. I do a lot of consulting for uh, engineering leaders. Uh, if you're interested in that, just go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com. Happy to set up a free conversation, free consultation about what we can do together. All right, uh, seeing a bunch of questions. So uh, let's see what we got. Um, Pellet, what stops the innocent newcomer from being the newer pair? I'm not quite sure what you're getting at uh, at that. Um, Pellet, but uh, when you're doing pair programming, you should be uh, you should be switching pairs frequently. So uh, even if one, if two people who are fairly junior miss something, typically somebody like will, else will come along and see it and fix it later. Uh, Pellet went on to say, uh, there is nothing in the unit test that says, by way, presense of URL parameter can may cause unintended code usage in the router module. I'm sorry, Pellet, I don't, I don't get what you're saying there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the next question. Maybe you can refine, uh, you can say a little bit more about that. Oh. Ah, I see, I missed it. Uh, is there something you should do to stop some innocent newcomer that thinks, boy, James should James should just have a URL parameter on the HTTP object and some other person using that in the router later? Uh, that is a real problem. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're gonna take a little time to understand how the existing code works and to understand that, but it is a real problem. This is the design drift we talked about last week. It is a real problem that uh, you carefully design your code to prevent problems. Somebody comes along and they they think, oh, that just makes everything difficult, and they put in a shortcut. So the short answer is, as a team, try to avoid shortcuts. Try to think deeply about your work. But it does happen, and I don't know how to prevent it. Um, it definitely does help to do pair programming or mob programming because then you've got a lot more perspectives. And typically, you'll have somebody on the team that say, oh, wait a second, we built this this way for a reason. But if you've got if it's just been a long time, then you got a bug or you're, you've reintroduced a bug. Test-driven development, I wanna be really clear, test-driven development doesn't prevent all bugs. And this approach doesn't prevent all bugs either. But it does in practice reduce your bug rate down so far that it's no longer the issue. Uh, when I use TDD and this sort of approach, I get down to just a handful of bugs uh, per month. Um, actually, for the code I work on by myself, it's down to a handful of bugs per year. So uh, at that point, I'm just willing to accept some bugs. If you're in a really, really high uh, uh, a domain where bugs are just absolutely terrible, like you're doing life-critical software or, or really, really high-end financial stuff, um, then there are additional things you can do, but they get really expensive. This, in practice, this is good enough for almost everybody, and it's far better than what you typically see. Um, 
I Pellet's got some more questions, but I think I can go on to to Uncle Scientist here. I'll come back to you, Pellet. Uh, I just want to give everybody a chance. Um, Uncle Scientist says, uh, so I inherited a code base that uses a framework to manage the UI and backend database. Testing is minimal and creating nullable interface to the framework seems daunting. Any tips for getting started? Oh, that's a really tough one, Uncle Scientist. Um, some frameworks are really heavyweight and uh, extremely difficult to put a nullable infrastructure wrapper around. And that is really, I think, the performance trade-off you make when you choose to use a framework. Personally, I try to use frameworks that are more wrappable, that are not super heavyweight. For example, when I when I first ran into React and Angular years ago, and Ember for that matter, I evaluated all of them. And I decided that Re React was the one I wanted because React wasn't trying to own the world. It had a very simple and small interface, didn't try to do everything. Um, Angular turned out to be a real pain in the butt to test. Um, Ember wasn't much better. React was, was far better, although it wasn't perfect. So as much as I can, when you have a choice, try to choose the frameworks that don't want to own the world. That said, you do sometimes just inherit code that is hard to wrap. And in that case, you might use, want to use mocks instead of nullable infrastructure wrappers. Um, although I have come up with a bunch of tricks for doing this. Basically, you can just... Just with anything else, you can only wrap the part you care about, but with frameworks, big UI frameworks, that can get hard. Database frameworks, that can get really hard and you may not have that option. Um, some more comments here about Pellet's comment. Uh, yeah, get in the habit of reviewing the unit test before making changes, really good idea. Um, Pellet says, uh, in this scenario, since it was an issue in the router, would you be better served making a change there to prevent further issues? I.e. have a config block for the router that you specify paths that handle the query parameter. Uh, that I think is a really good idea. And in fact, is how most you know frameworks around uh, routing actually work as you give it a whole bunch of routes. Uh, in this case, I think that's overkill because what we have here is just one route. And again, you aren't going to need it. Just solve the problems you have in front of you. In addition, um, I, I just, I really like the solution because even those, all those frameworks, like for example, Express or Happy, which sadly has being discontinued, um, they, they always give you an out. They always give you an escape hatch to basically say, I'm going to handle all routes myself. And in that case, you're back in the situation where you could have a potential error. Um, honestly, if I had control over the entire world and could wave a magic wand, I would change the node.js API because it turns out I have made this mistake a lot. Uh, this was a genuine mistake. I didn't do it for the sake of, of you know, coming up with a cool exercise to show you all. I made a real mistake because I always forget about the stupid query strings. So if I would, ch if I had the ability to change this for real, I would change the underlying node request object to not have that URL or to at least give you a, a URL object or some sort of thing that uh, parses it out for you so that you can avoid making this mistake, uh, which is why ultimately I put it in the HTTP request. Uh, Pellet says, uh, "Happy is unhappy now." Yeah, apparently they uh, they decided to uh, they decided to retire it. I'm not sure why. I never used it, but I I actually thought it would be a really interesting exercise to do here for this channel to do a refactoring where we went from our existing uh, code to using the third party framework. But um, and I was going to use Happy for that, but that's that's not going to happen now. Anyway, that is uh, that looks like all the questions. That is how you fix a bug in a way that improves tests or improves your long-term quality. Not only fixing the bug, but also improving it long-term. Uh, quick reminder, next time, July 14th, noon Pacific, we're going to be looking at flaky tests and how to prevent flaky tests that involve dates. And um, that is it for this time. Thanks very much, everybody, for watching. If you'd like to get the finished code, I'm going to check it in with the tag 2020-07-07-end. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, Pellet uh, asks, uh, do you have any, tend to have any topics around min minimizing pain points around databases? I'm not sure, Pellet. Um, it's a it takes a lot of work to set up that kind of example, and I, I have a limited amount of time to prepare these episodes because I actually have a whole other secret project that is very close to being announced, probably this month, uh, that I'm working on in the majority of my time. 
but I know it'd be really interesting to do that. So it is in the back of my mind. Anyway, that's it. Thanks everybody very, very much. I will see you all next time.